Three, in 1981, he soon he was recruited by Alabama University physics department and become a professor there. But after the discovery of high PC material, soon he was uh, recruited again uh, by Columbia University applied physics department. I become a professor there. But a year later, again, he was recruited back to Taiwan uh, by National Tsinghua University to become a professor there. And after several years, and again, he was recruited by the Daniel Sinikar as the uh, you know, uh, leader of the uh, physics institute there. And uh, I have to say that uh, he go up and up and then now, uh, actually, he serves as the chairman of the uh, National Science Council from 2004 to 2006. And he currently serves as the uh, president of uh, National Donghua University. And of course, uh, as many of you know that uh, his thesis advisor is the famous Po Chu, Dr. Po Chu, and who also uh, my thesis advisor eight years after he graduated. And that's why sometimes I call him Senior Wu instead of, uh, you know, Professor Wu. Okay, he went a lot of uh, honors and awards, and I will not them them all because the time is limited. So I just give you some example. 1988, USA National Academy of Science uh, Cop Dog Prize, and in 1994, Bertie Matisse Prize in 1994, YT Lee's Outstanding Scientist Award, 1998 NASA Special Awards, and currently, and uh, through for three years, and he was awarded by the Germany Humboldt Research Award. So now we welcome him. He will give us a lot of different aspects about the nature and neuroscience, especially on the uh, I am based superconductor, and let's welcome him. Thank you very much, Greg. Uh, yeah, it's has been uh, well, really a very honor and pleasure to uh, to lecture at this hall. I've been here maybe two times before, but uh, it's always a, a really a very pleasant uh, experience. Uh, Today I'm going to give you a, some perspective what we have done recently, and uh, especially that you know because the the so-called nanoscience nanotechnology has been become really an important area um, in recent years, and I think the importance of this subject will last for the coming decade. And so I, I think this is a good opportunity for people, you know, especially the young people here. This is a great uh, an area that I probably would like to look into uh, for the next you know, future development, okay? But not, of course, not necessarily the area I'm working on. I'm just using what I have done and what we learned from here as an example to, let, to tell you uh, the story. And before I begin, I want to introduce to you a, a book recently published. Maybe you already see that in the bookstore, but Frank, I'll give you a copy later on. Okay. This is very interesting. Uh, it's a collection of uh, the story that happened since uh, 2002, okay, or 2003. So about 10 years uh, in Taiwan, there is an important initiative by the government on the so-called National Initiative on Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. Many people involved, hundreds of scientists get involved in this subject in all fields, physics, chemistry, computer scientists, even later on some biologists are involved, double E, of course. So we, believe, we, we thought that this is a good time after 10 years to sort of a record you know, put that as a record of what we have accomplished, what we have done. So this is the book we uh, uh, published recently, and uh, through uh, interview of these scientists. So a lot of interesting story inside, and I think that you can maybe some youngster can be inspired by 
the, the speaker, and many of them probably you know people from NTU, from Tsinghua, and Academia Seneca, okay, so. The main thing is that what we really learn here, particularly in Sun, okay. But let me go back to 2003 or 2002 when we first discussed what we should do as a community for the science development. Okay. So there was, that was the time, a lot of excitement, new, tech, new idea about nanotechnology and new technique has been uh, uh, developed, established. So Taiwan government decided that we thought to put in some investment in this area. So there was a discussion, what should we do? Okay. Um, of course, I mean, there is one group of people say, we should have a focus or integrate big center, something like that. You're like a Japan, or the, the Korean is doing, they usually have a major big project. And, but there's also group, which, because Taiwan is seems to be more diversified, but we should have a more divided or distributed system to work on. And of course, on a beta, the decision was that way. Because this is a distributed system. And nail technology is so wide. We, how can we just think, focus on a single object? And if we want to focus on what is the area? So in a sense that, OK, we have established several core centers. And so we, this is the first thing. We decided that we should establish several core around the island, many in the west coast in the beginning, okay. uh, from north and like the head one, yeah. from uh, Academy of Seneca and Tiu and Xinzhou area, Taichung and Tao. So we, we uh, invest some money to set up some centers so local scientists can use that facility to do the work and so on, and then form some kind of integrate effort and to put into more detail in terms of uh, material and some new technology development, of course, some, you know, the property characterization of the material developed and so on. So, and I think that decision we made uh, 10 more than 10 years ago, I think, you know, if we look back from what we accomplished today, I think this is the right decision. Uh, otherwise, if we have a one single focus area like in Taipei, <coughs> the other, the diversity we see today. Okay, and, and in fact, there is some already consequence or the in, impact to the industry, which we, I don't have time to go into today. Uh, we already see that kind of uh, impact you know, happening. And I think that kind of decision was proper. And with that, you know, let me just highlight a few cases. Uh, to show you what we have accomplished in terms of this kind of uh, integrated effort. For example, this, this, this is a whole series of, probably you all know, a lot of people from this center of uh, this uh, Convention Medical Institute. And this is from one single lab in this institute, right? The Chen, the Li Chong and the Chen Guixian's lab. And they were able to, not all the publication, I don't mention, but the input, important and they can have so many different interesting nano material developed. And some of them, we, of course, you know, even today, I think they're still working on that um, to um, make a further impact in terms of application and more fundamental science. Okay. And one highlight is uh, this work from uh, Mo Zhong Yan. Uh, I think he was also somewhat in this building, like he had a lab here. And I think this is the paper that uh, jointly published with uh, Chen Shoshin of MIT. I think this was the highlight of the, the work. Because this paper was selected as the uh, 2005 uh, the PNAS uh, award. They get this uh, first kind of rally award you know, for the best paper of that year for physical science. Okay. And the essentially is that they are able to use a nano dimensional material and then study the water structure <coughs> inside that. And this is the term. A uh, very interesting and very exciting work okay, uh, coming up on uh, this area. And of course, there's a follow-up of this work is continuing in terms of uh, uh, the interface of the water with the material and so on. Okay? And uh, further uh, consider you know, how does that affect the human life possibly in the future. Okay? Of course, and this is another also from Mo Zhongyan, and he was using this mineral. Mature as a 
a drug carrier. And I, I was told by him recently that they have a much better, you know, and they, they, they will combine it with this IPF, with the stem cell uh, combined for some kind of destructive delivery system uh, developed. Uh, here is another example from Tsinghua, uh, the professor Guo Zhangzi. We have been trying to push the industry to use this technique, but so far not very successful. I think Taiwan, Taiwanese industry is you know, a different thing. And the beauty of this is that they were using a single chip and uh, one, this is an array of a nano rod, and they can dope the material, the zinc uh, gallium nitride, with a different uh, a characteristic. So uh, the emission of light, you know, has a whole range of uh, the spectrum. They essentially get a true white light okay, uh, emission. And that has a very high intensity and very well controlled. Okay, of course, the process is complicated. Uh, however, if the industry adopts this idea, they probably can really build up a, a high intensity and very powerful uh, laser, oh, uh, white light LED. Okay. And I, I think you all probably know this. This is from uh, Institute of Atomic and Molecular Science by uh, Wang Yilin, who is also, oh, I think he's also in the physics here. And this has already a uh, very uh, pronounced, I mean, important medical application, yeah, as I understand. Okay, there are a couple of uh, uh, real systems being uh, implemented and try to use in a medical uh, uh, facility to use that for virus detection and so on. Okay. This is essentially is a nano array, array of a nano uh, particle and use that the, the surface enhanced Raman uh, to uh, detect a single virus. This is really impressive. Well, there are some other highlights. I'm, I'm not going to go through detail. You know, it just show you that from different group and different labs. Okay. So essentially, um, this is sort of summary in Taiwan, okay. And from the neuroscience and technology, uh, we do bring in some new insight into uh, a quantum phenomenon, atomic assembly, interaction among biology and physical science. Especially, we have a lot of new tools. You know, for example, if one group in Academic Seneca Institute of Physics, my colleague has developed a very cheap way of uh, making uh, AFM, and now they were able to use that to probe the surface in water. Okay, And that's is a very essential uh, for the future development. Okay. And bioimaging will become a major issue. In fact, uh, end of this month, there will be a big, well, important workshop between Taiwan and Japan. And a group of scientists are getting together to talk about uh, using a new kind of a bioimaging technique, optically or x ray you know, for biomedical applications. And for society, actually, there are quite a bit of uh, uh, application being developed. Uh, Taiwan probably is the first country that has a mark. Really, the government granted so-called nano mark to the product. So you can buy the product with a formal certified uh, mark, using it as a coating for, uh, but, well, basically, I think now if you go to the store to buy this, um, the surroundings, you know, like uh, uh, for bathroom, bathroom uh, 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 appliance, they all have a uh, nano coating, okay, to uh, enhance the characteristics. So anyway, that we, we are very happy for ten years we do uh, develop something very very nicely. But here, the, in the next um, thirty or forty minutes, I use uh, my own journey to talk about what really the nanoscience can change our concept or change our way of thinking and looking into some interesting subject. Okay. So I'm talking about this high temperature supercomputer and this is the beginning, okay? For the last two years, we realized that in order to really understand this phenomenon, we probably really need to go to this regime. Uh, for some of you who doesn't know about, because some of the audience probably were not born. 
when the discovery was made in 1987. Okay, but let me give you a review of the history. Uh, superconductivity was discovered in 1911, and after 75 years, I mean, this is how the, the super, superconducting transition was evolved from 4 degree Kelvin to like a 23, for almost three quarter of a decade. Okay. And at that time, actually, many scientists, I think Frank probably would know, would agree. They would say superconductivity died. No body can, there's any chance or any future. And it's, if you extend it, you want to go to the liquid nitrogen temperature, is about 400 years. <laughs> it takes 200 to, to reach that point. You follow in this trend. Normally, this trend seems to be reasonable, right? But there are long linear curve. You can start from that. But, but very luckily, in 86, these two gentlemen in Switzerland, they found a new system, new material, which it has an oxide. And normally, oxygen is bad. It's not good for superconductor. When you have an oxide, usually it means that uh, not good conductor. And the conventional wisdom that it's not a good conductor is not supposed to be a good superconductor. But anyway, it was found this thing has a TC and within two years, this thing was you know pushed up to ninety hundred Kelvin from twenty three Kelvin all the way. Okay, so this is a quantum jump. And here I want to uh, tell a little story why I returned to Taiwan. And Grace mentioned that I've been moving here, 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 right? and I, I was just moved to, uh, I just moved to Columbia as a full professor. I thought I would stay for long. I, I even started to look for a house, and they would put a down payment already. <laughs> but well, I have to come back to Taiwan in the middle of the year because of family uh, affair. So I came back, and uh, at that time. President Lee in Denver was very interested in superconductivity because he read Japanese paper every day, right? And there were reports on superconductivity daily in Japanese paper because every day there's a new discovery, new thing, and that happened all over the world. So he read that and he doesn't know, of course, he studied it. Uh, he doesn't is a very uh, curious, you know, and hard working. Person. So he studied a lot. And somehow he knew I was in Taiwan and he knew, he knew my name through the report. So I was arranged to see him, to talk to him in 1988. Okay. Right before I, I was about to go back to the US. And I was introduced to him and uh, just a very nice uh, uh, chat. Original arranged for 30 minutes. Right? We talked two hours. And he kept on talking, and you know, I was very amazed. As a, he, he was an agriculture and, uh, and economist, and he knew quite a bit about supernatural through the newspaper, of course. <laughs> but so it was very interesting. And so we were very nice conversation, and he even later on said, well, should we develop something in Taiwan? And I told him, of course, at that time, there's no low temperature uh, research. Not much effort, no investment. So I told him that, yeah, this is a good area and this is a very important area. We need to go. And most interesting that before I was just about to leave, he said, hey, can you stay for two more days? Uh, that was, a, I think that was a Thursday I met him and he said, can you wait until next Monday? You know, stay here until next Monday, then we return to the US. I said, why? Oh, Monday we have this uh, monthly meeting in the presidential office. You give a talk there, right? You do? I don't know. Anyway, there's a Zhongtong Ye Hui. It's a Zhongli Pinian Zhong. Every month there's a meeting in presidential office and invite someone to give a lecture to all the cabinet members, lecture translator, and so on. I said, why don't you stay and give a talk there? to all the government officers. And, and I was very blunt to uh, young people. I, you know, Why should I? Why those old people, they don't understand what's going <laughs> on. Because at that time, all the government officers and the, the lecturers are very really old. They right? were very old. And if you know, 88, Taiwan was in a critical era because the 
Jiang Jingguo just died and he assumed the presidency. So he was not very stable. Okay. He said, John Ma, okay. I want you to tell the people the time is changed. Because you see, superconductivity, 75 years, no change. And now one day, <laughs> <laughs> suddenly one day you change from 20 degrees to 90 degrees, right? This is quantum jump. If you want to tell those old people, this is the time I want you to change. <laughs> Essentially, that's what he told me. Actually, <laughs> right? I said, well, this is something interesting. <laughs> but not an easy job, I accepted it. And I, and I was actually the first person to give a lecture give a talk at that position as a non-government yeah, officer. Anyway, that was exactly so. <coughs> and I returned to, US, to to Columbia, and about six months later, I got a phone call from Liu Zhaoxian and said, and how I want to establish this uh, low temperature superconductivity research. Can you come home and so on? And, and that's how I came back. Okay. All right, and so we were lucky at uh, 87, and that was a exciting okay, time. Uh, I was still in Huntsville. So the, the, the material was made in Huntsville and measured and then published. This is the paper. But up to now, up to 25, more than 25 years, OK, we have a lot of advancement or the progress in terms of superconductivity research. We learn a lot. OK, we know all the phase diagrams, what they look like. In terms of, this is a typical so-called a phase diagram means they describe the physical property of the material by looking at the how much carrier, this this is the doping from the doping concentration, indicating how much carrier was introduced to the system. You can have uh, the so-called whole doping, which is a positive charge, or the extra doping. And, and in this region, we call it parent comma, which is that, you know, the origin of the whole series that is the insulator, normally it has an interferometer made all the low temperature, okay? And when you introduce carrier, it gradually become metallic and eventually become superconducting. But the, the behavior of this kind of metal, although here it's called a normal, is really not a normal metal, not like a <coughs> copper or silver, very different in terms of characteristic. Especially there is an interesting line you, uh, when you cool down the system, you come from a so-called uh, trench metal, and then some some kind of gap is opening uh, from the base structure, and then becomes superconducting. And it's all the superconducting transition always go with a, a dome like the um, PC, and then when you have add more, it becomes the PC drop. Okay? The same thing you can do for the uh, electron doping. Although there is some kind of asymmetry, okay, so the structure is exactly almost the same, right? But uh, anyway, so a lot of detail, a lot of work, and a lot of information, but still we don't know why we are leading from here to here. And what does this line are really doing, okay? It's still not a, it is still an open issue, okay? A lot of discussion, the model, describe it. So, Still a good work, although recent year, uh, because of the, what I'm going to talk about, more work in that particular system and less people are working in this. But I believe that we need to go back and examine the whole system again. However, uh, for the last two and a half decades, you know, there are many advancements in superconductivity you know, related to the high PC, uh, for example, the carbon 60 was discovered in the 90 and was found to be superconducting if you dope with alkaline metal. And TC can be very high too, like a 50 something degree. And this is one system of probably will be a, a real application very soon in terms of making wire, okay? Because of magnesium dioxide, usually, this is look like a great thing, right? Like, uh, basically, the structure is similar, but with some boron in between. And has a PC of a 40K. But it is very good for uh, making a, um, a trench board, uh, like a, a for superconducting wire. And this is the mystery. Okay, I think the people in the uh, condensed matter who are working on this, uh, Dolphin has been working on this 
for a long time. Because usually this parent compound, the co uh, cobalt di uh, dioxide with uh, some sodium dopamine, is an insulator, okay, magnetic insulator. However, you insert with some water in between, then become a metallic, a superconductor. Okay. So still a, a big mystery why, what the water is doing. In fact, uh, there is also an uh, interesting thing. Uh, I, I'm not going to talk about it, so I mentioned it here. The new superconductor, which I'm going to talk about, is the ion based superconductor. One of the systems has similar features is a layer compound. And some Japanese guy really funny. Okay, they started by dipping to water, wine. Why <laughs> <laughs> wine, 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 okay? And they claim the best wine, the best property is coming from the French wine. Like <laughs> Anyway, so but obviously water or hydrogen is put doing something like that. So, so this, uh, I, I, I'm not sure people have tried to use wine to, uh, maybe this is one way to do it. Anyway. Well, the excitement actually came again after, uh, you know, 80, they, you know, 86, 87 uh, high. Uh, gradually, like, died down, but by, 2008, this paper then come alive again for the superconductivity. This is a, a Japanese group, and they reported that there is a new <coughs> compound with the iron as the key element. Okay, and lanthanum is the normal is the lanthanum oxide iron arsenic. Okay, with the chemistry uh, chemical composition of one 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 one. But when they first uh, dope this with the fluorine, you know, to do the oxygen side, and induce the carrier and become metallic, eventually find the superconducting around 26 Kelvin. The temperature is not high, but the real surprising was why with such an iron element would give you such a high PC. Usual iron, the magnetic, magnetic from conventional DCS theory or the superconducting, because superconducting you require the electron form of pair, you know, with the opposite spin. And with the magnetic, usually you can kill this kind of a thing state, okay, flip it over and then kill the conductivity. And we call it deparing. And why the iron here would do that. Okay. So immediately it caused a lot of uh, excitement. Uh, that was that paper was reported in about in late February. In fact I got a preprint it took a lot. Everybody got a treatment. And then about three weeks later, we found another system. Okay. So we were able to very quickly follow and found an even more interesting system. As today we can see is that we have a very simple iron, certain iron compound. And the binary system, the TC is low, like 10 Kelvin, but we have pure iron with the selenium forming because this kind of layer structure and becomes superconductor. And this system actually has been known a long time. In the past, it has been used as a magnetic. Okay? A lot of people study magnetic for the magnetic devices. Uh, we're using the iron sun. Uh, we were lucky that uh, we can uh, you know, stabilize a certain phase, which is this is called tetragonal structure and that becomes superconducting. So we, we, we have a much simpler, well, the, the good thing is that there is no arson, so it's less toxic, okay? It's much safer for us to handle. And then, uh, so we're very, very happy to have that result. And about the same time, there are other four, two, three systems came out, okay? Um, this is one, immediate follow-up from China. <coughs> And a German group also find another system. It's uh, uh, basically the same. <coughs> they are, all have an arsenic as a component. However, you look at this system, okay. immediately we see some common feature. That is, all this material has this iron and arsenic or selenium formed into this uh, tetrahedron.